In the 1960s, which was a peak of revolutionary turnover in Africa, there was a movement that went pro-democracy. Since then, African countries, the people themselves, have seen some growth and some development, but they've also discovered that democracy is slow. And it's vulnerable. When you treat everybody as an equal, then you assume that everybody has equal invested in the outcome of the state, which is not true. Through this period of increased investment in the democratic system, it didn't work. What do you think is one of the most important things happening in the world right now? Um, I think that I've been keeping my eye on the coups in Africa lately. Mm. I think that it's an interesting shift that's happening, that's been happening in the last decade or so. It's funny because most people don't realize that like, Africa is a very tumultuous place. Mm. There's always change happening. But that the change that has happened there recently is kind of unique because mm -hmm. while coups in Africa are kind of a running joke, mm -hmm. the frequency of coups is not funny. Right. And it's, it's what's being highlighted lately is that what we're seeing now, we haven't seen since the 60s. So it seemed like Africa was on a trend. African countries were trending a certain way. They were trending democracy too. They were trending democratic. Right. Um, and now, in the last decade, we've seen that trend completely fall apart. Which is really interesting when you think about the fact that not long ago, there was an African Union uh, group mm -hmm. that went to both Kiev in Ukraine and mm -hmm. St. Petersburg in Russia mm -hmm. to try to talk to Putin and Zelensky both mm -hmm. about the ongoing conflict in Europe, mm -hmm. right? Plus, you have the growth of the BRICS mm -hmm. from being a five-nation trading sector mm -hmm. to essentially now I think that they are 13 member nations. Yep. Like the developing world is very much taking a front and center, front and center position in ongoing international events, right? Yeah. So the developing world that is Africa. Africa is a huge chunk of the developing world. Yeah. Well, I mean, not just a huge chunk of the developing world, but a huge chunk of the Earth's resources, Ooh. right? Africa, the continent of Africa, I believe, is larger than all of um, the United States of America, all of Europe, all of China, all of Russia, like shoved together. Yeah. So that land mass is full of really important resources for the rest of the world. And that makes everything there, everything that happens there, it makes it important. I remember when I was at the agency and they were prepping me for my first Africa-related mission. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, I mean, I was 27 years old, 28 years old, and I kind of knew nothing about nothing. And I remember thinking to myself, who cares about Africa, right? Like yeah. it's poor, mm. like it's broke, who, it's, it's all dirt roads and single story buildings. Mm -hmm. Like who cares about Africa? Mm -hmm. And and then during my research, my prep for the actual operation, mm -hmm. they had me look at Africa mm -hmm. as a continent mm -hmm. and not as like a figment of right. like geopolitical definitions. Mm -hmm. When you actually look at Africa on like Google Maps mm -hmm. or Google Earth and you look at it from uh, from a satellite view, yeah. Holy smokes, you can see how resource rich that entire continent is. Yeah. North Africa's desert, mm -hmm. South Africa's desert, mm -hmm. but then the whole center of Africa yeah. is jungle. Yeah. Like, and it, where there's jungle, there's rich soil, mm -hmm. there's minerals in the earth, there's raw mm -hmm. materials, there's, there's trees, there's people, there's life, there's water. It's yeah. unreal how rich Africa really is. Right, right. And then how you know what makes that important is the or what creates value there right because we all live on land that has the potential to bear resources that are valuable what makes those resources valuable is the ability to actually mm -hmm. extract the resources mm -hmm. and put them into something else that's valuable right. which has traditionally been done by outside countries right, right? outside countries coming in and make you know creating influence or making arrangements so that they can take those resources in exchange for something else. Yeah. Um, and, and oftentimes yeah. what they're exchanging is is infrastructure yeah. and know-how, right? Because if you're, I mean, if you're a poor country mm -hmm. full of uneducated people, but you're resource rich, mm -hmm. the hardest thing for you is extracting the resources and then refining them into something sellable. Mm 
So when you have a first world country come in mm -hmm. and offer to partner with you, mm -hmm. they'll bring in their knowledge, their resources, their know-how. Mm -hmm. They'll build the infrastructure in your country right. and then train your people to extract the resources with mm -hmm. essentially the promise that 20 years, 30 years, 50 years from now, mm -hmm. you'll have your own indigenous capability. Right. And that's been the way that the Middle East, and that's the way that, you know, old oil in the 1970s, and that's the way that most of Africa, even now, mm -hmm. is kind of abused mm -hmm. because first world countries come in and make these deals. Yeah. And then the dictator or the, or the semi-permanent government of that country mm -hmm. says yes. Right. And I think part of, you know, a, a large problem with African countries has been the instability. So, you know, throughout history, outsiders have come in, have exploited various peoples around Africa. Africa, you know, was made up of different countries than they have now previously, tribal systems, you know, and then you had Westerners come in and colonize, mm. um, steal people, <laughs> you know, as resources. I mean, just, you know, really horrible things that have in the long run, created a lot of damage. And when, at a time when uh, I think, you know, there was a time when the West was pretty aggressively trying to export democracy mm. as the solution, the solution, the way, right? Um, you know, it looked like, you know, African countries were going to pick up on that as a solution and run with it and be, and be profitable and be successful. Yeah. But the truth is you can't, you can't take a system that, you know, for example, for America was basically homegrown, right? Dem like the um, America was born out of a revolution mm -hmm. and we decided that we would be a federal democratic republic, right? We decided that on, the people here decided that on their own, that yeah. was the revolution. Yeah. But you can't export that and just plop it onto other people who have a completely different history and culture and ethnic makeup. I mm -hmm. mean, within the countries, they have, you know, their own ethnic makeups that make yeah. up one African country, right? So, you know, it's not a surprise that it hasn't worked. Yeah. And honestly, it's not a surprise when they poll Africans now. And oftentimes, the Afri you know, African people are in favor of a strongman government. You know, if the strongman can get things done, what they want is a solution, right. right? If the strongman can get things done faster, can put food on my plate faster, give me a job faster, secure my household faster. Yeah. Then I vote like, for that. Then I vote for that. Right. Right. Which is really interesting because if you're, what you're basically saying is that, you know, the 1960s, which was a high, a peak of of revolutionary turnover in mm -hmm. Africa. And, and Africa is a continent right. with multiple countries yes. inside it. But during that peak of turnover, mm -hmm. there was a movement that went pro-democracy, 1970s, 1980s era. And now since then, 70s, 80s, 90s, African countries, the people themselves, mm -hmm. have seen some growth and some development, but they've also discovered that, bureauc that, that democracy mm -hmm. is slow. Yeah. Democracy means bureaucracy, bureaucracy means slow. And it's vulnerable. And it's vulnerable, exactly. It's vulnerable yeah. because when you treat everybody as an equal, then you assume that everybody has equal invested mm -hmm. in the outcome of the state, right. which is not true, especially not in a country like, or in a continent like Africa, where multiple countries have dealt with everything from you know extremism mm -hmm. to internal coups to, I mean, human rights abuses and the list goes on, right? In, oh my gosh, the stuff that exists in Africa, child soldiers and the drug trade and human trafficking, like it's in, it's a, it's wild west. Right. But then, so through this period of increased, you know, investment in the democratic system mm -hmm. by multiple countries around Africa, yeah. it didn't work. Like it didn't bring them results. No, it was it a didn't, facade in, in a lot of cases. It didn't yeah. change their economic status. It didn't boost their lives. It didn't make a measurable impact on them. Yeah. Now enter into the, the 90s and the 2000s, mm -hmm. strongman leadership yeah. starts to press in in Africa again. And you start seeing the return of these, these juntas, these military yeah. coups that take over and oust this, the person in the permanent seat, the, mm -hmm. the voted seat. Right according to democratic standards, and a new strongman leader steps in, mm -hmm. and with that authoritative, authoritarian government, mm -hmm. they can make things happen quickly. Yeah. And even though they make things happen quickly that benefit themselves as the strongman leader, yeah. 
there is an actual measurable, tangible difference in the lives of individual Africans. Right. So then it becomes this trend mm -hmm. where, like you were saying, when polls happen in Africa, people are mm -hmm. actually saying that they would prefer authoritarian rule over democratic rule. Right. And African countries aren't the only ones who, you know, who prefer that method. I mean, right. there are plenty of monarchies around around the world that still exist. And the that's, you know, a lot oftentimes they're from tribal tribal societies mm -hmm. and that's how it works. Mm -hmm. And that works for them and they prefer that. And that's okay. Um, I think what's interesting to watch is how are governments around the world going to um, engage with these new governments, yeah. right? Because does the carrot and stick approach work? Does, you know, where you say, oh, you're not democratic, I'm, I'm not dealing with you. Yeah. I think we're at a point where you can't do that. I think you, we are at a point where we need to understand the, you know, we, we talk about this at the CIA too, where you need to understand the culture of a country in order to best engage with them, right? Whether you like their culture or not, whether you agree or not, you have to understand it because that levels the playing field yeah. where you can um, communicate with them and, and understand what their needs are, what their wants are, and the best way, you know, I mean, if, if a country, you know, oftentimes like, you know, the United States government gets criticized for dealing with countries who commit human rights abuses. And I agree. Like it's, it's a horrible thing that we have to deal with countries that commit human rights abuses. But the truth of the matter is that there's not really much we can do about that right, right now, right? We can do lots of things that are going to take a long time to come to fruition. Education, bringing people. I, um, when I worked as a social worker, we worked with a lot of um, Af refugees from various African countries um, and uh at the time, um, they, uh, female genital mutilation, um, like mm. female circumcision, was an issue um, that was often talked about. And from those conversations about uh, FGM and what to do about it, FGM, female, female genital, female genital mutilation, mutilation um, came the con came the idea. I learned the idea that change has to come from the inside, right? Mm. Like. And a Westerner cannot go to a country or a tribe that practices FGM and say, that's messed up. You guys need to stop doing that. It has to be somebody from that tribe mm. who goes out and educates themselves and broadens their perspective and then takes it back. So there's a number of, I think, really interesting points here that I would love to dig into. Mm -hmm. And before we jump into, you know, the spy, the spy lesson that's hiding just under the mm -hmm. surface here. And the, the long-term impact of what we're really saying is a decline in democracy across Africa. Mm -hmm. I want to take a moment just to thank our sponsors. Mm -hmm. Now, the sponsor for today's conversation is Aura. And Aura is a cybersecurity company for the everyday person. And Jihee and I use Aura. We're proud users of Aura. We, we log into it. We have our own profile. Uh, it tracks everything from our financial expenses to our credit report. It lets us know about whether or not our footprint on the dark web is something that's expanding or contracting. It helps us to eradicate any of our personal information from data brokers that are collective, actively trying to collect our personal information, the personal information about us as individuals, us as professionals, our business, our family, our children, our social security numbers, and the list goes on. And Aura is a fantastic tool for anybody who's really trying to control and protect their online persona. In addition to the actual functional tools that Aura offers, things like dark web monitoring and uh, data broker erasure, in addition to that, they actually also back their process and their program up with a $1 million built-in insurance plan that protects your digital identity. So even if you are a victim of identity theft or if you are a target for identity theft, you can rely on Aura to come in and protect you with their own built-in insurance program. It's a fantastic tool. It's an all in encompassing tool. It works from an easy dashboard that you find on your uh, mobile device, on your iPad, on your on your tablet, on your cell phone, even through your own laptop itself. A fantastic and easy tool to use to check on your current status, to check on any th that the status of the people you love, the people you care about, all right there in one easy to use dashboard that's backed up by insurance, that's actively on your side, bringing you enterprise level cybersecurity solutions on an individual level. I want you to check out Aura.com and, and, and if you are 
you're looking for a cybersecurity solution, the best place to go today right now is go to aura.com forward slash everyday spy, where you can sign up for your own two week complimentary free trial offer where you can get to use and apply Aura to your lifestyle and your digital persona today. Go ahead and click in the description box below and you'll find a link there for aura.com forward slash everyday spy or you can visit it yourself by putting it into your own browser window at aura.com forward slash everyday spy and you will find your way to your own complimentary two week free trial offer with Aura at the sponsor for this fantastic conversation. Now you were talking about the decline in democracy across Africa, and you were talking about the importance of change happening from within. And I think this is really important because we're talking about the increase in coups that have happened in Africa, a developing nation and a developing nation with increasingly close ties to our Eastern adversaries, yep. right? Africa has grown closer as a continent mm -hmm. to Russia, and they have grown closer to China. They have aligned themselves with the BRICS trading bloc. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this, is, this is not the Africa that we so often think of when we think of this foreign distant place that's jungles and dirt mm -hmm. roads, right? This is a developing country with a ma or a, develop a developing um, continent mm -hmm. with multiple countries that have access to incredible amounts of natural resources. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the coups that have occurred in just the last 10 years, they actually draw like a belt mm -hmm. across Africa. We're not talking about just, this is only happening in Central Africa. This is only happening mm -hmm. in Northern Africa. It's actually a belt mm -hmm. of countries that essentially connect the Suez Canal mm -hmm. all the way across to the Atlantic Ocean, mm -hmm. right? And it's an incredible amount of connectivity and continuity across multiple countries where these coups have happened. Right, yeah, from the Red Sea to the Atlantic Ocean, you could walk, you know, 2,000 kilometers or whatever it is, all the way across countries that have fallen to military dictatorships in the last 10 years. And these countries, I mean, they the the ones that we've talked. I mean, Mali is one of these, right? Like mm -hmm. Chad is another one of these. Mm -hmm. These countries that have collapsed. Gabon is one of these countries. Yeah. These countries that have collapsed have a history of at least trying to become democratic, right? And then over time, they have on their own, of their own decision, their own volition, they have moved towards mm -hmm. authoritarian regimes, and even now are controlled by authoritarian regimes. And the coups that they're experiencing are one strong man to another strong man, right? Right. And, you know, I think what's interesting is oftentimes when people think about resources in Africa, they're not talking about the people. They're talking about the physical resources, right. the, you know, the minerals and deposits and rare earth, you know, things that are there. Um, and that's, of course, what China is there for. Um, and what, the Belt and Road Initiative that China yes. has. Yep. Um, but the truth is that, you know, Africa is full of people, people who could become really capable and just like you said if P if if an outside country wanted to actually invest instead of you know just building them roads and taking their resources they could build their roads and then like you said teach the people who were there yeah. provide jobs provide education um you know con other outside countries instead of going in and saying democracy is the best, have exchange programs where they go and, you know, the people from various countries can be educated in the, you know, whatever country it is, gain an education in something that can help back home. And in the process, they're getting ideas and broadening their perspectives. And then the, the trade-off is you have to go back home and take it back. And it's a slow process if you do it that way, right? It's more soft power than hard power. Mm -hmm. But that kind of that creates influence, right? And I think influence is what everybody's, I mean, that's what all governments are doing, whether you do it covertly like Russia does, um, or you do it overtly. And, you know, I think covertly is generally faster because you're dumping a bunch of money into a very clear message. But overtly, I think, you know, has the potential to have a, a larger positive impact. And if, if, Africa is positively impacted. If if Africa is lifted up, right, that lifts up the rest. I mean, we're on the same earth. It lifts up everybody else. I mean, I yeah, you know, I, here's my I, idealism uh, coming through. Sorry. Exactly right. I, was, I'm, I really <laughs> feel bad because I'm about to take a dump all over your idealism. <laughs> Great. Because the truth is, like, you're right. You're right. Influence mm -hmm. is a time-intensive and costly endeavor. Mm -hmm. 
And that's why every time you consider an influence campaign, right? Mm -hmm. CIA taught us this. Every time you consider whether or not to invest in influence, you have to be asking yourself, what is the long-term benefit right. of the influence that you're building? Right. Versus the short-term benefit if you choose to shortcut the influence. Like you just said, right? Covert influence can happen faster and in a shorter period of time. That's why Russia does it. Mm -hmm. That's why China does it. Mm -hmm. That's why they use... Though they use leverage and manipulation to build influence with a strong man leader right. that gets shit done quickly in their best interest. Right. That's that's the that's the Eastern way, right? Mm. They don't care about the masses. They don't care about the people. Mm -hmm. They care about the resources that they can extract in as short a period of time and as quickly as possible with a few key decision makers. Right. Because unlike the United States, unlike a unlike a democracy mm -hmm. where the decision makers are voted into power by other real decision makers, right? Mm -hmm. The constituency is the decision making body right. of the United States. That's not the way it is in Africa, right? right? It's essentially, if you've got more guns, if you've got more drugs, if you've got more people, if you've got more eggs, mm -hmm. you can get people to fight for you. Yeah. So then that's what Russia and China bring to the table, right? You give us the gold mm -hmm. that you mine with our tools from your mines, mm -hmm. and we'll give you more AK-47s, right. and we'll give you more food, and we'll give you more booze, and we'll get like, that's honestly how it works. Mm -hmm. It's still like, no kidding, horse trading. Yeah. Right? I mean, there's no way soft power with a long-term view is ever going to compete with that. Not in the short term, for sure. But then in the short term, how do you counter the Russian and Chinese influence? That's where the trick comes. That's where it gets, it gets tricky. Mm -hmm. Because we have now, as the United States, we have regulated and policied ourselves into a corner mm. where we can't condone bribery. Yeah, We can't condone essentially the way that the world works outside of the United States. We've actually policed ourselves into an economic disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And what's what are we going to do with that, right? right? Like 20 years ago, we could pat ourselves on the back and say, hey, we're taking the moral high ground and we're going to represent democracy and freedom yeah. for all living people. The thing is, people may want democracy. They may mm -hmm. want freedom. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter what the lowest level individual wants in an authoritarian country. Right. I mean, I think what people really want is their basic needs met. Exactly people right. People want security. Yep. People want food, food. Right. People want health care, water. Yep. Like they want, they don't want to have one out of every four children die. Right. And it's like, it's unfathomable to them mm -hmm. that they can have it. Right. Because we have it in the United States. We have it in the West. There are huge parts of the world mm -hmm. that literally don't know what they're going to eat the right. next meal. Right. Yeah, it's fascinating. So for, so from my point of view, mm -hmm. like we're gonna lose Africa. We're gonna lose Africa until we can either go head to head and offer something compelling, mm -hmm. like what our adversaries are offering, mm -hmm. like what China's offering and what Russia's offering, because they offer real benefits. Right. But the problem is, in order for us to compete with, with the likes of Russia and China in a continent like Africa for the rare earth minerals for the resources, for the strategic value of their geography. Mm -hmm. The only way we're gonna be able to compete in that space mm -hmm. is if we play a little dirty. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, like, are, first of all, who, our government can't even pass its own freaking <laughs> budget right now. Yeah. How dirty is it gonna play in Africa if it can't even figure its own game out here? Well, I mean, not to mention that it takes a lot of money. Yeah. Right? Like China's dumping money yeah. into Africa. We're dumping money sees... into Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. We got, we well, got the places for money right now. And the United States has never wanted to dump money into Africa. That's true. Ever. I mean, we just haven't seen it as a, you know, it's interesting because, you know, we have this democratic government. It changes every four years, you know. Um, and we, I just think that nobody has ever taken a long view for the potential for Africa and the United States. And so we've never prioritized the financial investment that could have been made over time in Africa, where China has been investing in Africa for some time now, and they will reap the benefits of that. Well, China's also finding that not all of its investments in Africa have been wise. That's fair. Right? Because it's, it's going upside down on certain loans, and its Belt and Road Initiative is turning out to be more expensive than it is productive. Mm -hmm. So for sure, 
countries, first world countries have learned that there are very real risks to investing in the African continent. Mm. That said, I mean, there's there's a way to do it that just hasn't been cracked yet. Mm -hmm. There are there have been multiple commercial enterprises that have gone into Africa and been very successful. Mm -hmm. Telecommunication enterprises, logistical enterprises, rare earths, uh, uh, gems and and precious metals. Mm -hmm. There's been multiple industries that have made fantastic gains, mm -hmm. adapting and adopting, you know, African culture. Ba based on the country, based on the tribes. Because like you said, the, the country lines inside Africa are kind of worthless. Yeah. So, you know, people have had that success, mm -hmm. but countries have not yet learned how to leverage geopolitical influence and geopolitical advantage right. successfully, especially not in such a volatile place where an entire government can change mm -hmm. because a different strongman leader steps up to the plate. Right. Or a, or a military takes over and undermines everything. Mm -hmm. Right. So... I think it's it's super interesting that you're bringing this up right now because I think when you take a 10,000-foot a view of what's happening worldwide, you kind of see Africa is a microcosm mm. of the rest of the world. It has, it has authoritarian countries, mm -hmm. dem democratic countries, mm -hmm. countries that are transitioning into democracy, countries that are transitioning out of democracy, mm -hmm. countries that are very... Uh, resource wealthy yeah. but tax base poor and other countries that are tax base wealthy and resource poor like you have essentially a microcosm of the entire planet mm. just in the african continent mm -hmm. so when you see democracy on the decline in africa mm -hmm. you have to ask yourself is democracy on the decline worldwide mm. and when you see authoritarian rule mm -hmm. being something that the people themselves are asking for yeah you have to ask yourself the question, is that going to happen worldwide? Mm -hmm. Is it, are we working in that direction? And frankly, looking at American politics, honestly, looking at American politics, I feel like that is what a lot of Americans are saying. They want some sort of strong man in power. Mm -hmm. They like to see the fighting across the aisle and they want to turn, they want to turn a, mm -hmm. a C-SPAN report on the proceedings in Congress. They want to turn that into an actual win or lose blowout fight, mm -hmm. right? How many people in the United States right now would raise their hand and say yes to a one-party system as that's long as it's their party? That's fascinating. That's a, that's a really interesting question. And, you know, Latin America, the Latin American countries, as they began to free themselves from Spain when they created their governments, they created a really strong executive because at the, unlike England, Spain kept attacking <laughs> again. Um, and so they, they needed a strong man, right? They, they wanted, you know, the other components, but they wanted their executive to be strong enough yeah. to be able to just make the call. And I do think that's a fascinating question about the United States right now. How many people, if you ask them, would say, yes, I want somebody who I believe in, yep. you know, to be able to just make the decisions. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I, between clients and customers and family members, mm -hmm. it's rare that I come across anybody right now who values our democratic system. Mm -hmm. What they value is democracy, mm -hmm. but not the actual way democracy works. Mm -hmm. They want to see, you know, a strong Republican leader. They want to see a strong con uh, liberal leader. They want to see the entire other party ousted. Mm -hmm. They want to see, they want to see an impeachment that's successful. Mm -hmm. Like it's insane. The, the stuff that they want is not, is not really healthy, mm -hmm. right? Look at what just happened with the Speaker of the House, mm -hmm. right? The Speaker of the House, uh, the former Speaker of the House, right. successfully passed a budget mm -hmm. and prevented us from a government shutdown, right? And was a Republican leader in the in the House, mm -hmm. or a Republican a Republican leader right. for as the head, the Speaker for the House, and the way that he closed the door on keeping us from having a budgetary crisis mm -hmm. was by passing a interim solution that got a budget across that actually benefited both Republican and uh, and de Democratic mm -hmm. priorities. But it was a compromise. It was a compromise, but it covered both, and it was interim. It only lasts until mid-November. Right. And somehow coming out of that, what I would consider a success, mm -hmm. the hawkish Republicans oust him from office, mm -hmm. right? Like, 
he actually did what democracy is supposed to do. Right. Right. He actually passed an interim bill so that the government wouldn't shut down so the American people could continue to have a functioning government only for another month. Mm -hmm. That's all. <laughs> yeah. It's unbelievable to me. It was a short term solution. It worked exactly the way democracy is supposed to work. And he was punished mm -hmm. for it. Now, I have my own theories about his long term, you know, mm -hmm. political career being benefited because right. he was ousted by his own, you know, hardcore conservative brothers. Mm -hmm. But there's no that's that's not a success. That does not send a message to the rest of the world mm -hmm. that democracy is healthy and working. Right. That sends a message to the rest of the world that strong men mm -hmm. are in control. Strong men are the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because because the the hardliners that you know pushed for him being outed, what's the stance they're taking is a strong man stance. Yeah, this is what we're going to do. If we don't do this, no decision gets made. It's yeah. It's, the stuff you hear come out of Biden's mouth mm. and the stuff you hear come out of Trump's mouth mm -hmm. is all strong man talk. Yeah. It's it has nothing to do with with accepting or acknowledging anything other than mm -hmm. their strong man position. Yeah. Right? Like the way that you talk Biden's whole like, for God's sakes, how can you let this happen? <laughs> Like all you're doing there is you're saying mm -hmm. that you disagree with something mm -hmm. and you're belittling me if I agree with it. And that's why you're asking this like backhanded question. Mm -hmm. And then of course, most of almost everything Trump says mm -hmm. is like, this is stupid. This is dumb. This is the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> so it's like two strong men. Where, where in the world mm -hmm. did real democracy go where we say, I can see the benefits of this mm. and I can see the benefits of this. Mm -hmm. And we have to decide which benefits we care about. Correct. Where did that go? I, I don't remember the last time I saw it, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> and we're old. <laughs> we're old enough that we should remember the last time that we saw this. Yeah. But anyways, I don't know. So we've spent all this time talking about strongman rulership in Africa. Mm -hmm. And we have not even acknowledged that strongman leadership also exists in our own freaking household. <laughs> And you know exactly what I'm talking about. Except it's strong six-year-old girl. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what exists in that our household. That is exactly household. what I'm talking about. Our daughter is. A strong man. The strong man of our household. Yeah. And I feel terrible about it sometimes <laughs> because our son is like the kind, gentle, democratic country. <laughs> right? <laughs> He's like, everybody has feelings, everybody has value, mm -hmm. everybody has needs, like, and he yeah. wants to try to like yeah. validate and help everyone. Like, what would you like to do? Yeah. I wouldn't really like to do that, but if you really want to do it, <laughs> maybe we could do my thing tomorrow. Yeah. Like, that's our son. Yes. Our daughter is like, I want to do this. And when you're like, I don't really want to do that. You can't even get your sentence out because she's like, ah! <laughs> no, I don't really, ah! No, just let me, ah! like she'll, she just railroads you yeah. until you're like, for God's sakes, fine, fine. We'll go buy you another LOL toy. I don't even know what LOL stands for. We're going to go buy you the freaking toy. Right? Yeah. It's unbelievable. She negotiates. Oh yeah. So we went and got a flu shot today. Yeah. You know, yeah. We went and got a flu shot today and I was like, kids, we're going to celebrate our flu shot by buying Lego sets. Mm -hmm. And my son was like, awesome, dad. Mm -hmm. And then a lie said, that sounds great. And I was like, okay, you can have $30 Lego sets each, mm -hmm. which is a decent sized Lego set. Oh, like, yeah. Well, whatever you guys want to pick, you each get the same size mm -hmm. and I'll spend $30 on both Lego sets. And there's mm -hmm. plenty of parents out there who are like, you're a dumbass. <laughs> plenty of parents are hearing this and being like, that's, that's insane. But I was like, it happens once a year. Yep. And the flu shot has been such a bane of so many days for us. Yeah. But I'm like, you know what? $60 is a small price to pay Yeah. to get this thing done. Yeah. So my son, our son mm -hmm. says, I wonder what I'm going to get for $30. Yeah. Our daughter says. $50. <laughs> You're like, what? $50. Oh it's a $50 goodness, set it's you're getting me, right? $50 set. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I said $30. Wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> we're going to do 50, right? No. <laughs> How about if we do a really good job with our flu shot? <laughs> yeah. You give us the $30 set and another smaller set. Yes. And then the, the negotiation didn't stop. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I kept saying no. No, it's $30. <laughs> the negotiation never stops. It's it amazing. never stopped. Yeah. Like, 
No at the front door. Mm -hmm. No as we walked in the garage. Mm -hmm. No as we got in the car. No as we got the needle stuck into her arm. <laughs> it just never stopped, right? Yeah. And then we, I swear to you, the answer was no <laughs> until we got to fucking Target. Because <laughs> you're such a pushover. <laughs> They're carrying $30 Lego sets. And then she just pulls something off the shelf and she's like, I want this too. Yeah. And then my son, our son is like, I don't really want that, but if she's going to get it, I'll take one too. <laughs> exactly. And that's how I spent $90 yeah. today at Target. I, know, I feel like teaching her math has been like the most wonderful thing and kind of like the our biggest detriment because now she can add fairly big numbers and she like she figures out what she wants. She figures out how much it costs, and then she figures out how she's going to get that money. Right. And whether she gets it out of you gifting it to her, or she gets it out of you like working for something. I mean, we had them sweep the driveway, and I was like, you know, okay, you know, if you both sweep the driveway, you have three dollars each because it's a pretty big driveway, and they're sweeping all the acorns or whatever that are they're falling off. Um, and but she's still like she and out loud, she's like, okay. This thing I want is ten dollars, <laughs> and you're gonna pay me three dollars for this, uh, and then I can help with the laundry, and that's two dollars for that, so that's five. And she's like literally doing the math, so she can get her thing. How what work do I do today to do it? And then yeah, and then like you said, as soon as you get there, she starts negotiating up anyways. Yes, yeah, and that's strong man leadership. But that's that's the thing. What I'm saying is, geopolitics are happening in our house. <laughs> yeah. But also, we can't be surprised by how geopolitics plays out because it plays out the same way in your house. Yeah. Yeah. She's not a bully. No. Our daughter is not a bully. She is just strong. Mm -hmm. Her will is strong. Her tone is strong. Her commitment, her tenacity, her dedication is mm -hmm. strong. And when she directs it mm -hmm. at me... <laughs> And I have to choose whether I'm going to be strong in response or whether I'm going to like, I mean, I rationalize it in my head that I'm just redirecting the strength, mm -hmm. right? Like as, as stupid as this sounds to say out loud in front of you and thousands of other people. I agreed to spend $60 at Target. Mm -hmm. I ended up spending $90 at Target. Mm -hmm. Thank God I didn't spend $120 at Target. So I win. <laughs> Oh, wow. Because she could have gotten more out of me than she got. So <laughs> I, I feel back. so I feel like I won. How fucked up is that? <laughs> like that's I swear to you that's what developing countries are doing all over the world. Developing countries are realizing like it could have been a whole hell of a lot worse. Yeah. Thank goodness we got this. Yes. And then the it's only the other people, it's only my it's only the countries that represent our son who are out mm -hmm. there looking at the whole thing going that's not really fair. Yeah. Like it's not fair to dad. It's not fair to mom. <laughs> it's not fair to me. Yeah. And then, you know, he looks at his sister and he's like, you don't have to act that way. And she just gets yeah. a big smile on her face and she's like, here, I'll share my thing with you. Yeah. And then it's okay. So I'll share my thing with you. It's not your freaking thing. It's the thing that you stole from me. Yeah. So I think it's really interesting, that example, because, um, you know, it is the this trade-off in a lot of places where – you know, yes, there might be human rights abuses. Yes, there might not be, you know, journalists might be jailed, polit you know, political opponents might be jailed. But Quieted, if the, yes, silence. Silence. But if the basic needs of the population are actually being met, how many people are going to say something right. when the previous government before them, they were starving? And that's right? the same, the same thing's true for foreign countries. What right. foreign country can really come in and criticize a strongman leader if that strongman leader actually shows mm -hmm. more people are eating, more people have access to clean water, right. it's very hard to come in and be like, well, actually, your person abuses women. Right. But the people inside that country are like, yeah, but the last guy didn't abuse women and most of us died of starvation. Right. That's really hard to like find a common ground there. Right. And every, you know, when you have a strongman leader, every single one of them is different and they have to be judged based on their actions. And I think our daughter is a really good example of that, too, because oftentimes, you know, she is very direct in what she wants um, and she will take as much as she can get. But she also thinks about others. Right. She also says, I want this and then you can have this. Yeah. And it's this it's still this very, you know, it's not a take, take, take. It's a 
I'm going to take as much as I can and then I'll get some for you too. Yeah. So it's this I'll very... get some for you too is yeah. exactly how it works. Yep. Because she still prioritizes herself. Yes. First, mm -hmm. but she'll prioritize others next. Yeah. Which is really interesting considering how few people prioritize themselves at all. Right. Right. It is. It's So that's, I don't know what to say. Like this is, I feel like this is one of those great unanswered questions. One of the mm -hmm. things that makes what, what did we say at CIA? Human beings are sticky. Yeah. Right? Like it's not clean. Dealing with people is not clean. There's a residue. It gets stuck to your clothes. It gets mm -hmm. in your hair. Like it's sticky. Mm-hmm. And this is, a, I think it's a perfect example. Like, I, how do you solve Africa? I don't know. Yeah. How do you solve the developing world? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, is democracy the right way? I don't know. To your point, yeah. I know it works here in the United States because that's what we were founded on. Right. I don't know how it's going to work in other places. Yeah. And I know that strongman rule works in our living room. Our son kind of gets a better deal of things because his sister is a strong man. If it was just him and us, mm -hmm. if it was just a three-person family, yeah. he would for sure be a spoiled kid. Mm -hmm. But he wouldn't get half of what he gets right now. Right. He gets more because she demands more. Yeah. And then shares it with him, drives it to him, and you know obliges us to give more to him. Mm -hmm. It really is interesting. Like yeah. that, con It's a conundrum. Mm -hmm. He is better off because of her. Mm -hmm. She is a strong man ruler mm -hmm. who pushes us all around. Mm -hmm. And if we stand up to her, what are we really, we're not really making out. Mm. If we stand up to her, this is, and this is important to me, right? If I push back on my daughter's confidence and courage and incent, like insistence, mm -hmm. I don't want her, this is how I want her to be right. as a grown ass woman. Yep. Why would I break it? Why would I break her of it at six? Right. She could be this when she's 46 and rule the world. Mm -hmm. I don't want to break my daughter of this undescribable confidence and courage and tenacity, right? Right. I don't want to trick her and redirect. I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. I want to find a way to craft it into something productive. Mm -hmm. But good Lord, man, like most mm -hmm. of us, most of our peers spend their effort trying to encourage and trying to embolden and trying to you know, support mm -hmm. their daughters to be the way that our six-year-old is naturally. Yeah. So it's really, I don't want to fight her. Right. I don't want to lose $90 every time we go to Target, <laughs> but I don't want to fight her in such a way that it, right. it ruins her. Well, and I think like you were saying, I mean, it, it goes back to my previous point. I think that education is the key. Education, broadening perspectives, um, because I really firmly believe that change, change within a country, change among a people has to come from inside. Mm. Those people have to make the change that's right for them. And there's possibly a form of government that nobody has even conceptualized yet that's going to come out at some point in the future. Just like with our daughter, while like we are, she she is naturally a strong man, mm -hmm. but we are educating her, right? We are trying to guide her and give her perspectives um, and ideas. And so who knows what that's going to look like as an adult, right? It's not, she's not going to be the six-year-old strong man she is now and she's yeah. 46. She's going to have this- Evolved. Evolved from all these experiences and education that we will have provided for her. So I think that worldwide, we're going to continue to see shifts yeah. and we'll have to see what comes out of it. And it will have to come from the people within. So speaking of people within, we try to take a question every episode. Mm -hmm. Did we have a question for today? Yeah, somebody uh, asked, uh, which I thought was an interesting question, was uh, how how do you persuade others? Mm, this is a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that jumps to my mind is that we were taught that persuasion and influence are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. That influence is rational and persuasion is emotional. And that's the big, that's immediately something that always jumps to my mind, right? You can, per, persuasion is something that's driven through the emotional brain, through emotional response, whereas influence is something that's driven through the rational brain. So for example, if I uh, can, if I have a, po if I'm a positive influence mm -hmm. on a junior employee, mm -hmm. then they adopt a rational, predictable behavior 
of being responsible and showing up on time and doing the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, in, I'm influencing them, right. influencing them to ask better questions, influencing them to think before they act, influencing them to make some sort of rational change. Mm -hmm. Persuasion is very different. Persuasion is emotional. Mm -hmm. You persuade someone to do something and it's usually a short-term objective, mm -hmm. right? Like when a lie persuaded me <laughs> to spend more than $30 on Legos. She has this, also has this great persuasion face, yeah. which I think is something where she like squishes her <laughs> cheeks and like gives you a little pouty face. And, and it's very it, sweet. Yeah. And it makes me, yeah. It does, it works on you every time Because somehow. it reminds me of when she was like six <laughs> days old and she was all bundled up and she just looks at you and it's just like, yeah. <laughs> I might as well just write a new check. <laughs> But that's persuasion, right? right? Because persuasion is emotional. Mm -hmm. Because I'm taken back to her being six six days old. I'm mm -hmm. taken back to the feelings, the overflowing like joy and pride and relief of a new baby that's alive and healthy. Mm -hmm. and like that's persuasion. Persuasion is emotional. Mm -hmm. When when you, and I know that like luckily mm -hmm. we were both kind of hussy-ish <laughs> when we were younger. <laughs> <laughs> but. Like oftentimes when we're trying to get someone to go to bed with us, mm. we use persuasion, mm. right? We try to trigger emotions, whether that emotion is like lust or guilt or obligation or or whatever, right? <laughs> we we persuade, right? Uh -huh. You had to persuade me. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, I thought it was just natural attraction. <laughs> Guess not. <laughs> you weren't wearing natural attraction that day. You chose what you were That's wearing. That's fair. Uh, that's where my outfit was persuasion. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I that's, would that's add, persuasion, not influence. So, so when you look at a presidential debate, mm. right? People are trying the the candidates are trying to get people to vote for them. So, can you talk about the difference between during the debates, influence versus persuasion, and how that presents? It's awesome. It's a great point, right? Mm -hmm. And and we have we have a whole ebook about this, mm -hmm. right? New our our political um, playbook is an yeah. ebook that's available on our website, and it's all about this mm -hmm. decoding debates. Decoding awesome. debates. Thank you. We have we are in a season now mm -hmm. in the ramp up to the campaigns, mm -hmm. right? We are in the ramp up to the elections. Mm -hmm. This is a period of influence building. Mm -hmm. So the dog and pony show that we see on the Republican stage during the debates, the mm -hmm. primary debates, that's all for influence. Mm. They're trying to convince the voting public on the Republican side, mm -hmm. right? Registered Republican voters. They're trying to influence them into believing that a candidate represents a certain something, mm. right? Nikki Haley wants to represent rational, you know, conservative, conservative yeah. values, in and in a political professional way, mm -hmm. right? And Vivek Ramaswamy wants to represent change mm. and, you know, and bold, boldly moving into the next era and professionalism and, you know, mm -hmm. diversity. Like that's what he wants to represent. And then you've got the former bright vice president, Mike Pence, yeah. who wants to represent, I've done it before, mm -hmm. I'll do it again, Yeah. right? And super strong conservative values. They're trying to build influence so that they can get voters to rationalize mm. commitment to their, to their name mm -hmm. right now and carry that forward. Mm -hmm. Now, what does it look like in the last like three months before the election? Mm -hmm. That's all persuasion. That's when they all come out and they start promising the sun and the moon and <laughs> we're going to get rid of this and impeach him and do the end of, and like mm -hmm. taxes is getting cut for everybody yeah. and free beer, like anything, <laughs> anything they can say in those last few months to get people emotional enough that they'll go into the booth mm -hmm. and they'll fill in a circle yeah. that says what the candidate wants it to say. Yeah. Right. So we're in a season of influence building now mm. and you'll see it. You'll see it, how it changes, that it will become a season of persuasion mm -hmm. in the last few months. I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> so those are all of my thoughts. Do you have any thoughts to the contrary? Like that's where my brain goes when somebody asks, what is persuasion? Yeah. So I think it's really interesting because I always think of it from, this is because I find it a fascinating topic, the covert influence perspective mm. of, you know, Covert influence changes the, you know, the your the hearts and minds of people, um, and so I think you know, what I think what you're saying is you know influence is the changing of the mind 
persuasion is the changing of the heart. And I think you can see that in covert influence campaigns as well, the ones that are known, yeah. um, where, you know, oftentimes I think what's highlighted is the persuasion piece where people are getting riled up about something. Right. But there really is an influence piece where the same ideas are just propagated over and over and over again. And the more often you hear the idea, the more solidified it becomes in your mind that this must be right. I've heard it so many times. So many people are repeating the same thing. Yep. Um, you know, so I, I think it's just, it is an interesting distinction, yep. um, but they're both really important, you know, and if you're trying to use that, right, if you're trying to persuade or influence somebody, I think it's an important distinction to have in your mind to kind of develop your, you know, figure out how you want to approach the person and attain what you're you're going for there, right? Do you want to do the influence or do you want to do the persuasion? How fast are you trying to get it done? Yeah, exactly yeah. right. And what tools do you have to bear? Yes. Folks, thanks very much for joining us. I really enjoy these conversations. I always enjoy these conversations, even though it's a chance for me to admit that I'm, I adhere to strongman leadership. <laughs> <laughs> You're a strong man too. Nobody just gets to see what happens when the cameras get turned on. That's what, well, that's why our daughter and I are constantly butting heads. <laughs> like that, that little puppy dog face is not, not working on me work at all. I'm stronger than you. I know. I think I would have spent twenty five dollars today. <laughs> that would have been capped, <laughs> and then you can earn the rest. <laughs> but if you enjoyed this conversation, and especially if you enjoyed the question about persuasion versus influence, make sure you visit our homepage. The link is in the description below. Go to everydayspy.com, check out our shop page, drive yourself directly to the Decoding Debates ebook and get a head start now in what's happening in this 2024 election season with our ebook that absolutely disassembles the strategies that politicians use throughout the intelligence camp or throughout the, uh, the electoral campaign. So go check it out. Go to everydayspy.com. Uh, if you don't want to, if you're not sure where to start with Everyday Spy, go ahead and click on the first link you see in our uh, description box below and go take the spy quiz because the spy quiz is going to tell you more about you than you probably care to know. Just like I sometimes discover more about myself than I care to discover. But go visit that spy quiz, learn about you, and it will set you up on the path for success with Everyday Spy and all the stuff that we're teaching. And then of course, if you wanna show a little bit of love to our sponsor, you can make sure that you visit our sponsor link at aura.com forward slash Everyday Spy. Get some of that cybersecurity solution for yourself, for your family, so that you can move forward with it. We will see you next time.